Vulnerability management is a critical component of any cybersecurity program, regardless of its current level of maturity. Billions of dollars are lost annually to threat actors exploiting new vulnerabilities and especially targeting SMBs. As many as two-thirds are expected to close their doors for good within three to six months of suffering a cyber attack. In today's security threat landscape, it's no longer sufficient to scan or remediate vulnerabilities on a monthly basis. This ad hoc or relaxed approach to vulnerability management makes it impossible for security professionals to fend off new vulnerabilities, malware variants, and even zero-day attacks. In this video, we sit down and speak with Josh Allen, Chief Product Officer at PurpleSec, and ask him to share his insights on the top strategies for handling vulnerability remediation. We'll also discuss the remediation process, how to report on remediation efforts, some of the top challenges IT professionals and security professionals face when they are doing any type of remediation. And finally, we'll take a look at PurpleSec's solution for vulnerability remediation and how we're improving and streamlining the entire process. You won't want to miss this deep dive with a true defensive security expert. All right, Josh, thanks for being here with us today. Let's talk about vulnerability remediation. What is it? Sure. So short and sweet vulnerability remediation is fixing the vulnerabilities that you have in your environment. There is a lot of complex machinery that goes on behind such a simple mission statement, however. So there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of people working, and it requires you know, quite a bit of special attention on what's going on in your vulnerability management processes in order to properly remediate things for your environment. All right. So we talked about tools. Let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Talk about some of the tools that professionals might be using for remediation efforts. Sure. So vulnerability management is a pretty standard piece of security nowadays. Everybody should be doing it. Almost everybody is doing it. So there's a lot of tools and solutions out there available. Most of them are around patching or updating software that's out of date, right? That's your, your kind of bread and butter. But there's a lot of other things that you know can't necessarily be patched that are vulnerabilities. And that's where tools for visibility come into play. So you've got to have a vulnerability management program that's doing scanning. So Tenable you know, is what we use for our scanning. And of course, there's a lot of other competitors to Tenable out there. And that's your really starting point. You have to know what's out there. That gives you the visibility. From there, it can either be a people problem where you just take your scan results and you've got a team of vulnerability management experts who are taking in all that data, prioritizing it, orchestrating all the updates, scheduling things, working with your end users to make sure that, you know, the updates can be pushed through and all that. And then actually going into systems like Microsoft's SCCM for endpoint clients, if you're in an enterprise or Red Hat Linux can use satellite, or you may use some kind of third-party solution like Avanti to do your patch management on these systems. And that's focusing on not just your operating systems, but all of your software and, and really your entire digital footprint inside the enterprise. So tools are obviously a big part of any program, of any effort. But when we think about remediation efforts, there's always the people aspect. Touch upon that a little bit. Can you give a little bit of sense of what effort is required, what resources might be required, both on the security end, as well as maybe an IT team, if there's an internal or maybe third party? Oh, yes. It requires all of those. So it's very resource intensive, uh, both in time and in manpower, and sometimes in cost, especially if you've got some very sophisticated third party tools that you're using, it can get expensive in a big enterprise. So you've got to have a team who's aware of how to use the tools effectively in order to get the best return on investment from your security tools and, and these people that you've hired. So primarily you'll have your information security team. They should be the ones who are focused on getting your CVSS and risk scores from your environment, understanding what needs to be done and ensuring that your plan is going according to action, making sure the remediations are actually happening. Now, the people who are carrying out those remediations very well could be uh, IT staff, right? They could be help desk staff. Some of them can actually also be just the end user, right? Uh, and if you're in an organization that does development, maybe these systems that are vulnerable are 
owned by the development team and they're not necessarily information security experts. So you've got to have coordination between your IS team, your IT team, and your business units who are actually using these systems that have vulnerabilities on them. That's going to definitely be a theme, I think, across some of these videos is the communication and collaboration. No one team is responsible for security. So we're investing in all these tools as an organization, all these resources and all these people. But we're not just doing it ad hoc, right? We have a method to the madness. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that remediation process is and what it looks like today? Yeah, so it starts with scanning, as I mentioned. That's your visibility step. So the very first part of the process is you know, identifying what you've got, right? Find the vulnerabilities that are there. Next, you have to prioritize what to go after because vulnerabilities come in every day, really uh, new ones are being discovered. So it, it can be a large pile of work, especially if you're starting behind a deficit. So you, you have to prioritize where you want to spend your resources, especially if like everybody else right now in 2022, you're running maybe a little bit lean in the manpower department. And so you really have to prioritize where you want to put their time. Then the next step is to fix it. So this is where you jump into your your other tools for remediation, like your endpoint configuration managers, maybe your third-party tool like Avanti. Maybe you have a third-party service provider who's doing their mediation for you, right? So submitting tickets, something like that will be part of your fixing process. This is where it can also slow down quite a bit. This is where the most communication has to happen, especially when the vulnerabilities are remediated through changes to the environment's configuration rather than simply updating something. You know, most people are pretty amenable to software updates, but asking them to change their encryption methods or, you know, which network functionalities or ports they use can sometimes not go over very well, especially with a development organization. And you have to work around that. You have to communicate back and forth to make sure you're not impacting anybody's business and to make sure that it is getting remediated. So step three is a big one. It's uh, the hard one. It's the one that we're trying to tackle really the most with our sets of products and services because we know that this is where most pain is for organizations. And then once you've done that, step four is to monitor. Right? And that's just to make sure that things aren't coming back up. You want to make sure that your fixes stay gone. If you see stuff popping back up, then maybe you're provisioning vulnerable assets or something like that. This is pretty easy. Lots of the tools would do it. Monitoring can just be, you know, scanning and putting it in front of somebody's face every week, as simple as that. Or it can be something as sophisticated as an automated system that, you know, has threat intelligence and things like that, like our tools do. Right. And like you mentioned, step three, it's kind of an adoption challenge as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about challenges here in a second, but you know, you've got insecure system, but there's hesitation to do any patches because it might break something that's mission critical to the entire organization. It's just been a long, around for so long. Let's talk about some of the best practices for 2022 and beyond when it comes to remediation. You are a defensive security expert. You've been in this space for quite a long time. I'm sure you have some tricks of the trade that you've accumulated over the years. Definitely. Well, uh, tricks of the trade is really just, you know, seeing things done poorly <laughs> and finding <laughs> out what are the best practices to make up for these deficiencies that we see. You know, prioritization is a big one. I mentioned that earlier, especially if you're running with a lean set of people, you need to make sure that you're focusing on the vulnerabilities that are going to cause you the highest risk scores. So things that are critical, things that are known exploitable, right? For which there's a public exploit. So somebody right now could go download it and run it on your system and get you, right? Like a 12 year old kid could do it. So those are the biggest wins, first of all, because you know that they are a big hole in your defensive system. Prioritizing helps you focus on getting your threat landscape, you know, much, much smaller. So you want to make sure there's the least amount of targets for anybody who might be out there getting ready to get you. So, you know, lows are still low, low scores, medium scores. Those things are still exploitable and they can still cause damage, but those typically are ones that require several aggregated attacks on them in order to actually give an attacker enough access to do some damage to your organization. But ones that are critical are usually things that are like arbitrary, right? They don't need to fish. They don't need to get credentials. They don't need to do anything. They just need to attack you and you're going to get hit. So that's your number one thing on prioritization, getting those out of the way first, make sure that your risk goes down, give your lean teams something to focus on, you know, and, and get those wins. The next one is setting remediation timelines. So you want to make sure that you've told your organization and your team, and you've set it out somewhere, probably in the policy that you will remediate these vulnerabilities based on critical high and medium and where they're at, right? Like if it's sensitive systems that they're on versus public systems that they're on. So you need to set some kind of remediation timeline for those. 
So on the timelines real quick, Josh here. So what's an optimal timeline for remediating? You know, we talked about critical vulnerabilities, high, medium. What are, what's a good kind of rule of thumb when it comes to the timelines for remediation? You know, I actually get this question a lot, often from our customers. I'll tell you it depends. I'll give them the right answer based on their <laughs> see, scenario. Right? Answer, but, right? <laughs> you know, it, it really does, though. I talked a little bit about criticality, number one, and the type of systems that they're on, number two. So knowing those two factors, which is something that we help you do, and our system will absolutely help you do automatically, you can come up with the timelines on this. And so the recommendation is as soon as possible, really. Within seven hours, but if you're a little bit more mature, 48 hours, is that something that is achievable for some organizations? Is it achievable? Yes. Have I ever seen an organization whose personnel allows it to go that quickly? No. Okay, um, so back to the realism. Yeah, but okay. that's something that, you know, we are trying to change with our products here. Uh, and the automated VM system is a big part of that. So our system cuts down on this prioritization and lets us queue up things within more achievable timelines than most people would be able to do, right? Without mm -hmm. this software enhancement. Were there any other best practices that you wanted to mention before we kind of move on here? From those remediation timelines, we've kind of been talking about doing an SLO, your service level objective, right? So you want to make sure that you set that realistic and aggressive. Our solution can actually let you set and monitor those automatically. So bringing your scan results, we, we automate the prioritization, orchestration, scheduling of the remediation, and we can do it based on those SLOs that we set from business to business, depending on what works for the customer. And that will allow us to achieve those objectives realistically and quickly. There's quite a few other best practices. They're on our website, but the other one I want to bring up, make sure people you know start doing more is continuous and automated vulnerability remediation. This is what's going to help us bring those SLOs down. Can you give a little more context here for at least the automated bit? I think we touched upon it with the prioritization a bit. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to expand on? That? I, I mean, yes. the continuous seems a little bit uh, straightforward, right? <laughs> it should be. I mean, your, your vulnerability management program should be based on these timelines where you're doing this activity every week, right? Some yeah. kind, like you should be running like an agile team. Uh, it's not just a one-time thing. So the next step now is automating those tasks that are low skill, high repetition, right? That take up time from your security team to do, like looking at vulnerabilities and going, yep, we should patch this one. Yep, we should patch this one, right? Like that doesn't take a lot of skill. So our system's doing that for you and allows your skilled people to actually use their skilled time on more critical security tasks throughout the organization. Right. It might also help with retention too. I mean, as a security <laughs> yeah. guy who's done vulnerability management, I mean, there's a lot more out there that you might want to be doing and learning about. So let's move on to reporting now. Now there's different types of reporting that I'd like to discuss a little bit here because maybe you've got your project management team that needs updates and reports that you need to have tailored for them. Obviously your technical teams, your IT staff, and then your security professionals are going to have their own set of reporting. And then of course you need to have executive reporting and be able to speak to that language. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that reporting should look like within the uh, capacity of remediation efforts? Yes. So as you mentioned, there's multiple audiences for the reports and they each have their own tasks, right? So the report needs to tell them different things based on what they have to do with it. For your IT and information security team, you need vulnerability reports that are technical and maybe not overly verbose, but are very clear of what the vulnerability is, what system it's on, and what the remediation steps are to fix it. That is something that both of those teams must have, which is something that our system and really any good system these days will tell you in the reports. Next is the executive level. So they need to understand less so about, you know, what and where are the vulnerabilities, but they need to understand what is our risk score for the organization? What are the threats? How likely are we to be exposed and what are our efforts and how effective are our efforts in remediating these exposures? And I think it uh, just like a vulnerability management gives visibility to the vulnerabilities and threat landscape, the reporting, especially at the executive level, gives visibility to that return on security investment. At this point, we've talked about what the remediation is, talked about the process, the tools, the people, some best practices, now reporting. What are some of the top challenges that you've seen over the years that come into play when you're trying to get these vulnerabilities remediated? First and foremost, a lot of places don't have a very clear cut remediation process. They have some kind of process that's sort of working, but 
you know, there needs improvements. Lack of communication is always a problem. And as we've talked about, communication is extremely important to this because there's a lot of different people and units and people of different technical understandings involved in remediation of vulnerabilities. You know, as you said, it's it really is everybody's concern, security is. So it requires communication. A big one also is supporting end of life systems longer than they should be supported. So what, what's something that you can do about that? I mean, is it just kind of um, pulling off the Band-Aid and investing in new systems, overhauling and going through all of that engineering effort to get things working? I mean, that might be the only option, right? Well, I think number one is a fundamental change in the way that we pr- we view these legacy problems. Up until now, the way in the industry has really been, you know, how do we keep supporting and keep securing these legacy systems? But what you as, especially as CFO, a CEO, a CIO, right? One of these C-level people who are not only concerned about the security, but about the business and about costs as well. Your question should not be, how do I support legacy systems? It's how can I move to new systems, or rather, do I need these legacy systems, more importantly, right? Brings me to another another big challenge. And so a way to, to make this smoother with the organization is to have a good testing environment where you can actually test out your changes, give people the comfy feeling that they are going to be safe and secure and not break their stuff. But a lot of places don't do testing environments. Yeah, why, why is that? that? That's exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> um, I, I would say it's hard, but I don't want to give people that excuse. It's not hard. It's a little bit of an investment. It does require another process stream. Like you have to dedicate a resource to being somebody who can spin up a virtual copy of whatever system you're concerned about, install the patches, test you know, go through some kind of validation, make sure it gets signed off on, communicate out with the organization and then implement the test. Oh, I see. It's just a lot of work. Okay. It, it's an extra processing. <laughs> it is, but I mean, I think it, it I mean, sounds like it's pretty important. All right. Well, Josh, I want to I want to spend just a little bit of time here. We've got a few more minutes before we wrap up. Talking about PurpleSec solution to vulnerability management, we touched upon a few things, but I want to give you kind of closing thoughts here on what we're doing to kind of redefine the status quo of the current process today that a lot of companies are kind of sadly using. A lot of our focus is on the challenges and the best practices, right? It's those gaps that we're seeing in the industry, mostly from our security personnel being people who've worked in industry, right? So we've seen it firsthand and, you know, we always thought there's got to be a better way, right? We were that burnt out vulnerability management person going, God, this sucks, <laughs> right? So we've worked on building solutions to make it a lot less painful for the clients as well as for our own security personnel if we offer this to you as a managed service versus putting it in your hands. So it's a lot faster, first of all, because we're automating as much of those repetitive processes as we can, allowing them to do it at machine speed, right? They're quicker at prioritizing things. It's, a lot of it's just math and computers are really, really good at math. So we let the computer do the math, which also means it's very accurate, right? It's going to find what's out there. It's going to know exactly exactly what's going on because it has a lot of these different systems pulling in. So it's not just seeing what Tenable sees, seeing what Microsoft sees. It's looking at your entire environment, all of your security tools, and there's a person looking at it. So it's taking all of these different cross sections of your security posture and analyzing it. And then doing all that frees up your resources to do other critical security tasks, as I've already mentioned. So when you don't have your people focusing on just patching and updating systems and and trying to prioritize and stuff, you can actually focus them on doing things like moving your legacy systems to a new, you know, up-to-date system, re-engineering the organization, right? Making you better, faster, and more efficient internally as a business as a result of not having to focus so many resources on security. That's what we're trying to do for our customers. That's where this ROI comes in for you, our customer, is that you know we are trying to really take it out of your hands. You know, a lot of people don't want to think about security, and that's fine. Uh, I like thinking about security, but that's why we should be monitoring it for customers. Absolutely. Well, Josh, thanks again for taking the time to be here. I think we covered quite <laughs> quite a bit of content here today. And it's I a big think topic. It's a big topic, and I think it's something that we're here to help organizations solve for. So thank you again, and until next time, take care.